that he saw you don't deserve to be going through this. You did not do anything to bring that demon on. And somebody who's innocent, who is suffering, that is a tough place to walk. Because the enemy comes in and says, but you deserve it. You did this, you did that, you did this, you did... And he starts pounding away at us to the point where we actually believe a lie. No, actually I didn't do anything. I'm a victim here. I'm innocent. And the kindness comes and restores. Anyway, let's go to Sarah. She's talked about in a couple places in the New Testament. We're not going to... In Galatians 4, Hebrews 11. We're not going to go there. We're just going to stick in the Old Testament. And there's tons in the Old Testament. Important to kind of remember that they are 25 years into their journey, basically. Almost, excuse me, almost 25 years. So they left one place. They were told to go to Canaan. They did. We're nearly 25 years down the road. And we get to Genesis 18, and it's the story when the Lord appears to Abraham, the chapter before, Sodom and Gomorrah and all that. And there's the Lord, the angels, and Abraham recognizes him. And In verse 9, while Sarah is in the tent preparing the meal, they ask Abraham where she is. And he tells them. Chapter 18, verse 10. Would somebody want to read that? The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah your wife shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, <laughs> saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, <laughs> shall I have pleasure? They make the announcement that she's going to have the baby. She's in the tent. She overhears it, and she laughs. And she's always taken heat for that, but the, we've said before in this setting that if you read the previous chapter, Abraham did the same exact thing. God announces to Abraham that Sarah's going to have a baby. He falls on the ground and laughs. God just told him they were going to have a baby. Abraham's the one who picks the following year when he's going to be 100 and she's going to be 90. And God says, okay, we'll do it next year. That's kind of the way I see it. You know, sometimes we speak things into being that we don't even know. We will actually act on something that we don't even know we're doing. It's a very interesting thing. And the next chapter is when the angels say, next year at this time, confirming what he said. In the, but the thing is, he laughed and she laughed. And we're working our way towards kindness here. Let's read verses 13 through 15. And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh? saying, Shall I surely bear a child, since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you, according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. <laughs> There's this thing going on with the laughter. Her and Abraham are challenged. Why did she laugh? And her response is the key part. She says, I didn't laugh, which is a blatant lie, mm -hmm. which would have been the time, to be honest with you, to say, I just got a question. I studied Genesis 17. You didn't take issue with my husband when he laughed. Did you guys read the previous chapter? If you read the previous yeah. chapter, my husband laughed at you, and you blessed Ishmael as a result. I mean, why am I being taken to task here? Why don't you ask him why he's laughing? She doesn't do that because she's kind. That's an example of kindness. Mm -hmm. She doesn't throw her husband under the bus, the bus. Yeah. which is what we all want to do. She wants a new baby's room. <laughs> yes, that's, that's right. Who's going to get it for her? <laughs> <laughs> now, Peter, in 1 Peter, the third chapter, when he's talking about wives being submissive, gentle, having a gentle and quiet spirit, he talks about the holy women of old who trusted in God. And then in verse 6, he says, As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are also, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. There's only one place that Sarah calls Abraham Lord, and it's in this passage. So you know Peter is referring back to Genesis 18, and he's using Sarah as an example of someone who did good. But she was afraid, it says in the passage. She lied because she was afraid, which makes it even more interesting 
that she didn't throw Abraham under the bus. Because it would have been so easy to throw Abraham under the bus. <clears throat> Her fear would be gone. She'd be cleansed, the whole thing. She's not doing any of that. And he's referring to that as a woman who did something good. This is the place he's talking about. See, kindness, I said earlier, and I'm just building on something, that it can be seen. But sometimes an act of kindness is not really seen. It's actually the absence of something more than being able to see it. In other words, she doesn't retaliate, which is a very kind thing to do. She doesn't seek retribution. That's a kind thing to do. She doesn't defend herself. She just remains quiet as an act of kindness. Genesis 20, we get a different look at Sarah. Back in Genesis 12, Abraham and Sarah went down to Egypt and they developed a plan that wherever we go and there's other men, they're going to see how beautiful you are. They're going to want to kill me to get to you. So what we're going to do, because they would kill her husband if, if they knew they were married. So we're not going to tell them we're married. We're just going to tell them that you're my sister and we're traveling to you, which was a half-truth, by the way. That's the way we're going to handle this thing. And Abraham makes it, this is the, the man of faith, he makes it quite clear that he's doing this out of fear. So now we go to an area of Philistia, Gerar, and they do the same thing. Because they've been doing this for years. If they went someplace, she's my sister, and that way they wouldn't hurt me. Okay, so that's the backdrop. So now they're in a place, they've laid that out there. In Genesis 20, verses 3 through 7, but God came to Abimelech in a dream by night, said to him, Indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation? Did he not say to me, She is my sister? She herself said, He is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands, I have done this. And God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart. For I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, and all who are yours. So, he doesn't have the opportunity, because God stops him, to actually engage with her. And God visits him and says, this is what's going on. And you have to sort this thing out with Abraham and he's going to pray for you and all this kind of stuff. Abimelech goes to Abraham and he challenges him about why he did what he did. This is an awful thing that you did. He sees Abimelech is operating in the place that he's operating from and God honors it. It's, it's really a, a very, very powerful way that God sees things that we just do not. But God does. Anyway. So he approaches Abraham. Verses 11 through 13. Abraham said, Because I thought, surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet, indeed, she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. Isn't that a great statement? <laughs> Isn't that a great statement? It's like, well, you're not a Christian, so I know you don't give a rip. Yeah. You know, you're a flipping, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I... You know, you talk about the judgment that we throw on people who have not come into a relationship with God or have something else happening and how we judge them. Well, I figured you're ungodly. The fear of God is not in this place. It's like, well, thank you very much. Anything else you want to say about me? You like my robe? I mean, come on now. Conti I'm sorry, continue. No. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said to her, this is the kindness which you will show me to every place we go, you say he is my brother. So that was the plan. Every place we go, you are going to show forth kindness for me. That was the plan. He uses the word, a Hebrew word, chesed, for kindness. It's the same word David uses over and over again um, mm -hmm. for loving kindness. David, the English word just flows loving kindness. It's just kindness, really. But David, in, in the Psalms, a lot of our translations, you know, thy loving kindness mm -hmm. is better than life. We, Psalm 63, we sing that. David is big on loving kindness mm -hmm. um, that, the, that God has shown towards him. Um, 
But that's what he says. This was our plan. That every place we went, we're going to lie. And that's going to be a form of loving kindness. That she's going <laughs> to, you know, basically he's saying, you know, I, I, I'd be oh. killed every place we went for her. Lot, you know, with Lot in the story of, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, the whole thing. When he comes out of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, he says that it's God's kindness, chesed is the word he uses, that spared him from being destroyed. He recognized that God did something for him because Lot was innocent. We know, we've heard that story. He was a righteous man living there. He didn't do anything, and God shows his kindness towards him. A lot of times in the Old Testament, this word chesed, that means kindness, loving kindness, is used as mercy. They translated mercy. You know, at the end of Psalm 23, when we finally get to the very end of the journey, surely goodness and mercy mm -hmm. will follow me all. That word mercy is this word again, loving kindness, which changes, to, for me, that changes the whole context. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Surely goodness and kindness, just like they are in the fruit of the Spirit, they're right next to each other, goodness and kindness. Surely goodness and kindness, when they line the people up, behind me, whose lives I've touched, you're going to see kindness all over the place. Like Lot was saying, he delivered me from something, but it also says that, like in Titus, that we're restored to. And what I like to think of is, like I mentioned earlier, if you know of somebody, maybe even yourself, I don't know, who's in a position that you wish you weren't in, it's not like you're sitting there saying, I'm guilty. Actually, it's the opposite. I'm innocent. And what that carries with it when you're being treated a certain way is if you're guilty, but you're not, you're innocent. But you're being treated a certain way that you wished you weren't being treated. And most people are doing nothing for you. But somebody does something kind. And it does have a way of delivering us from those awful words that the enemy would say, that people would say. It lifts us up out of that crap. It delivers us. And at the same time, starts to restore something that if you've ever been innocent and been pounded, it has a way of, of working on your dignity. Especially when you know other people are looking at you a certain way.